Hi and welcome to another edition of Cadence Fishing TV. Today we're on the fabulous Leeds Liverpool Canal just outside the friendly town of Chorley. We're going to try to catch a load of these beautiful caster fish. Today we're fishing the caster on the canal and the caster is a proven method for sorting out a slightly better stamp of fish. And when I say slightly better, hopefully an odd hybrid, maybe a bream, an odd big perch and certainly some of the canal's famed roach which do like the shell. Caster fishing on the canals goes back many many years and people of the likes of Benny Ashurst who had his own maggot breeding business and pioneered the caster was at the forefront of caster fishing in its infancy. The stretch we're on is at the bottom of a flight of locks called Johnson's Hill Locks and it's a prolific stretch and it's also a fantastic wildlife corridor in as much as you'd be surprised at what you see down here. We've already seen a kingfisher today. And now we've got another of those quality caster fish. And what was I just saying about big perch? There's the proof. And that came to the caster. In a match, I'd be very happy to catch two or three of those on the shell, that's a fact. Now if that elastic seemed a bit tight then, it is, and uh, I'm going to have to slacken it off a bit, but basically it's that tight because I had to tighten it up because we hooked something earlier that we presume was a roach that was immediately grabbed by a pike of six or seven pounds and I had it on for about five minutes before it decided that it was waking up and going on a run and ultimately bust the hook length but uh, left me with several inches of elastic hanging out the end of the pole. The pegs that we're on today are decent all round pegs that fish pretty much all year round. I think the reason for that is because you've got a mixture of features which the fish like. You've got flowing water coming down from the flight of locks above, which means there's movement in the water and food will come down through the lock uh, in the water. You have a couple of um, inlets where water comes in on the far bank and again, they're gonna be bringing items of food into the canal. So it's a natural larder for fish. Another reason I think it's a good area is because, as you can see on the far bank, it's lined with uh, some luxury houses and obviously they provide a form of shelter. So I'd imagine that the temperature here is always going to be a degree or two warmer uh, than out of town in the, in the colder months, in the winter months. And um, you've also got the fact that it's almost like a basin here, this part of the canal, it's very wide. I mean, I'm fishing at 15 metres and you can see that the boat's got to be at 25 metres away from me. Couldn't reach it if I wanted to. But when you plumb this area, you find that the depth goes down straight away off the end of the keep net and it's pretty much a uniform three and a half feet of depth all the way across the canal. 
and um, as I say because it's got um, flow to it because of the lock action with boats going through the locks it's um, it's an area where when the fish are here they've got to maintain station in the water because they're in slightly flowing water and if they're maintaining station then they're uh, using energy and what have fish got to do when they use energy they've got to replace it by eating food so you're pretty much guaranteed to get a few bites in a, an area like this I do like to prepare my own bait for canal fishing and that goes for casters too although that's not to say that good tackle shops can't prepare good casters so if you know a good tackle shop that takes the time to really put some TLC into turning casters great you're lucky now casters they're very easy to prepare but you've got to factor in the time you need and you need seven days from buying a pint of white maggots to turning them into casters and the key for me is to get them home riddle them through a maggot riddle to remove any bones or any feathers or any debris and then put them in some old sawdust I keep all the sawdust that I take maggots home in it's sweaty, it smells of ammonia but over time it goes dark and that's the type of sawdust you want to put them in and if you put a pint of white maggots into say four pints of old sawdust then add a quarter of a pint of water into the sawdust the maggots will ingest the water it helps them to stay big it makes them plump and basically you just need to keep an eye on them and for the first four days you just put them through a riddle once a day to remove any skins or any dead uh, debris or anything else that might be in there from four days in they start to turn and the best way to keep them is not to put them in water as they turn but just knock them down into a little black bag removing the air and just keep adding the casters as they turn over the next three days now the other thing as you can see these are kept in water these are the ones I've wanted to feed through the course of today and I've fed approximately half a pint because there was a pint in there these are just a handful I've taken out to let breathe in the air and through the course of the day they've darkened because there are far more tan and dark casters in there than you can see there are still white casters in this one so that's it caster preparation is not difficult it is a little time consuming but the rewards are worth it in the end if you want quality bait I don't know what it is about the caster really that fish find so appealing maybe it represents or looks like a small mollusk or some sort of water snail or something um, what we do know about it is that it's a very easy meal for a fish to eat because uh, having a crisp shell and a, a fluid centre a caster is very easy for a fish to crush in its pharyngeal teeth, its throat teeth and um, there's no doubt about it they do like them and um, I suppose it represents a very easy to digest, easy to eat meal when the water's cooling down and uh, obviously if they have to expend less energy eating something I suppose they will because they're all about preserving energy aren't they the Leeds Liverpool Canal synonymous really with caster fishing as well as bread punch fishing it's always been a canal where bloodworm hasn't been allowed and so anglers have had to find ways of finessing and uh, improving the skills at catching fishing matches and the key baits as I've just mentioned tend to be bread punch, caster and some worm fishing but the caster can be a phenomenal bait if you can get the fish switched onto it and they'll feed on it properly you can have some wonderful sessions with it I've used it for a long long time now caster I've been fishing with it for 30 years plus on canals and particularly at the uh, other end of the county in East Lancashire around Burnley and Blackburn uh, down the years I've had some phenomenal roach catches some big fish roach up to a pound and a half almost around Burnley and it was renowned for those fish on an area called the Straight Mile right in the centre of Burnley and in winter matches used to be one with anything up to 28 pounds of great big caster roach so it's a bait that shouldn't be neglected talking of neglect 
You'd have to say that the Leeds Liverpool, like many canals in the country, is neglected. You hardly see anybody on it. It's strange, you know, there's fantastic fishing to be had and, um, you know, the club that controls many miles of the Leeds Liverpool, Wigan and District, who own this length, do run popular matches on Wednesdays and at weekends for members. They're well attended, 25 to 30 anglers as an average. And the sport this autumn has been quite good. You know, uh, an average winning weight has probably been around 12 to 15 pounds of fish. There's a lot of skimmers uh, at the Wigan end of the canal now. And there are skimmers here too. But um, as I say, if you want to have some relatively cheap but enjoyable fishing, you should think about canals because it's fantastic sport. Basically, with caster fishing, it's an inert bait. Whether you pot it in or catapult it in, it's not a wriggling bait, it's an inert bait. It, it's, it's a chrysalis of the maggot before it turns into a fly. So consequently, it's either eaten on the drop by fish as it drops through the water layers, or it sinks to the bottom and it sits there and doesn't move until it's eaten by a fish. So what we've got to do is find a way of replicating the way that the loose offerings are behaving on the bottom of the canal with the one that's attached to the pole with the hook in it. And so basically, as a rule of thumb, I always tend to start off by carefully plumbing the peg, setting the float to dead depth, and then working from that basis. I use a Tipex pen on the top kit to mark dead depth and then I'll incrementally increase the depth so 9.9 .9 times out of 10 you're going to catch your fish by laying line on the bottom and it all depends on the day and how the fish are feeding so it can vary but as a rule of thumb I'll start off by sliding the float one float length over depth and I'll then go in with the rig and I will see whether I can make bites with that style of presentation. If the canal's towing quite a bit, you might find that you end up fishing two, three, even four float lengths over depth to achieve the presentation that you need in order to make the fish confident enough to accept the hook bait. The other important thing is the shotting because there have been times when a canal's towed that hard that you've had to put shot on the bottom. I've had to put shot on the length of line that's lying on the bottom in order to try and slow the float's progress down to stop it from ripping through the peg. And of course, that's a balancing act because if you've got the float dotted down to the nth degree and you lay a shot on the bottom, then you're going to have to remove some shot to create an element of buoyancy in the float to compensate for the drag factor and the fact that some shot are on the bottom, which could automatically pull the float under as a float trips through a peg. So it is quite a balancing act, but it's a simple one to work on. And as I say, start off by going a float length over depth and play it by ear. If the canal's towing too hard and you can't get the float to stay still enough for long enough to attract a bite, just add a bit more depth and just keep adding a little more depth until you do get bites. That tiny, tiny other element, which sometimes occurs, not very often on canals, I must say, but it can, especially in the warmer months, is the phenomenon of catching on the drop. So you may find that you set the rig at dead depth and you may have to change your rig and go for a very light one with spread out styles to try and get the caster to drop slowly through the water so that fish such as hybrids can intercept it on the drop. 
which is what they tend to do. So as I say, generally, by and large, I work on the basis of presenting a caster on the hook bait in a static, inert fashion, like the hook, like the loose offerings. There are three main ways to hook a caster onto the hook, and one that a lot of people prefer is to completely bury the hook inside the caster. If you're going to do that, you want to be using either a size 20 or a size 18 hook. So I'm going to show you now. You go in through the two eyes in the blunt end and push the hook down. You then carefully rotate the cast around the bend of the hook, like so, and then you use your nail of your thumb to tap the spade inside the shell. I just remove that blob of residue and that is a caster with the hook buried inside it. So that's one way of doing it. In fact, if you look, you can see through the shell, you can see the hook there through the translucent skin of the shell. So that's the first way. Now, some people I know don't bother with that at all. They simply hook it on as you would a maggot. So again, through the blunt end, where you've got the eyes, you, you literally just nick through the skin with the hook and then push the caster round onto the bend of the hook and that means that the whole of the hook is pretty much exposed and because the caster's got a crisp shell when you get a bite and you strike more often than not the caster just comes off on the strike there are no hard and fast rules about a particular colour of caster working better than another. Uh, some anglers like to have the casters all one colour. Others, myself included, like to have a range of colours. And I try to see what works best on the day. Some anglers are adamant that perch will pick out a light coloured caster over a darker coloured caster. And I know some anglers who swear by dark coloured casters to try and pick out bigger roach. I think it's all in the mind, to be honest. I think that it's whatever suits you and whatever makes you feel comfortable when you're fishing. But there's no doubt about it that the darker the caster, the more crisp its shell is. And for the third way of hooking a caster on, which we alluded to earlier, which is to hook it along its side so that it, it's actually flat on the hook. I'll just try and do that now with this one. There we go. I can just show the camera that. If you hook one on like that, then that's a great way of presenting a caster on the hook in the warmer months when the fish are coming up in the water and competing with each other and intercepting bait as it drops through the layers. Because the fact is, if you actually experiment and just throw a few casters in down the edge in a still water or on a canal, you'll see that they don't sink head on, uh, end on, they actually sink in a horizontal plane, in a horizontal fashion, in the way that this caster is hooked on, on the hook here. For me, at this time of year, the autumn into the winter, I want to make the fish aware that something's in the peg that they want to eat. So I don't think there's a finer combination than a palm full of well-cooked hemp and maybe 15 to 18 casters. On a match on the Leeds Liverpool at the Wigan end, typically, um, you wouldn't look at your caster peg for two to three hours anyway. You'd pot, pot this in at the start, but you wouldn't necessarily look at it for three hours or more. I remember a winter league last year when I didn't actually go on my caster peg until the beginning of the last hour in a five hour match. And then I managed to catch another six decent caster roach, which gave me another pound of fish, which boosted my weight from four pounds to nearly five pounds. So I'll always go in with a pot of caster and hemp at the start, and what I then do is every sort of 20 minutes or so, just pick up the catapult and feed a couple of casters over the top. So typically when I'm talking about feeding a couple of casters every 20 minutes or so, I mean just a couple like that. Don't worry if they don't go exactly in the right place. Just keep a couple going in every 20 minutes. Basically, something's going through the water column. The fish can hear it. They hear the noise of the casters when they hit the surface and roach with their eyesight can watch everything and they'll watch them dropping down 
it will make them curious and inquisitive. They'll come into the area. They'll then home in on the hemp and the casters that you've potted in. And even if they mop up everything that's there, if you keep a couple of casters going in every 20 minutes or so, they will keep returning. Fish are creatures of habit. If they know food's been somewhere, they'll keep going back to investigate, see if there's any more. And if you just keep that regime up of a couple of casters every 20 minutes till you're ready to go on it, usually, if they're in an obliging mood and they're feeding, you will get bites. Right, here's a tip for you. You need some small caps of cosmetic bottles. And I just go through them with a hot screwdriver and you can slide them just back onto your pole tip a couple of inches and you've got a perfect cad pot. This stays on the pole all the time, it never leaves the pole, you can see it's taped on. But the other interesting thing about it is that I've actually threaded some 20 pound line through and knotted it off about 5 mil down from the top of the cup and then you can drop some casters through that spider's web that you've created with line if you will and it means that when you're shipping out and you want to cad pot the odd caster into your peg for pinpoint accuracy there's no chance of those casters bouncing out if you're a bit clumsy or there's a sudden gust of wind or anything that affects your pole and makes the tip bounce so you can see it's a really good little tip that today because i'm pleasure fishing i'm targeting two caster pegs i've got one in line with the boat on the far bank just to the left of the hatch in the middle of the boat and I've and that's at 13 meters and I've got another peg at 15 meters aiming well left in line with the aircon blower on the outside of this penthouse luxury building across from me that means there's about 10 meters of distance between the two pegs they're probably on about the same line actually when I swing a 15 meter pole to my left like that but they're well apart and I'm doing this to try and maximise the catching opportunities so that I can catch a couple from one peg, feed it again, rest it, go to the other peg, catch a couple there, feed that, go back to the other peg and vice versa. Just try and rotate the two pegs and keep bites coming. On a match I wouldn't do that. On a match I'd only feed one caster peg. Um, you don't want too many lines, you've got to try and keep things simple. On a match I'd have a, a worm peg, uh, maybe a couple of bread pegs on different distances from me and at different angles and obviously a caster peg tucked out the way somewhere but in about three feet of water, that's important. And um, I'm just going to re-feed the peg in front of me opposite the boat and it's with the hemp and caster I just showed you before and I like to just spread that bait out a little bit and just spread it around so I'm just going to start shaking the the pole part and as you can see I'm just moving it about and just just spreading it over an area of probably three feet square I don't want it all in one pile concentrated in one little patch I want the fish to be able to graze comfortably in a relaxed fashion and and not feel that they're getting on top of one another and it just spreads them out a little bit and just helps, I think, to make them relax when they're feeding and not create any suspicion.
That's a tremendous example of what we've come for. When you're on a peg and leaves are a problem like today, I mean, when we got here, it was clear, but you wouldn't believe it. Sod to low, we've ended up on a peg full of leaves. A good tip uh, for pole anglers is to bring a small container of washing up liquid, put some on your fingertip and just smear it around the lip of your pole pot on your feed top kit, like so. Then, you go out to where you're fishing. I'll just do it down here to show you with all these leaves rather than going out to my peg. But you put it in the water like so and you can see how the leaves are now pushing away from each other. Can you see? And it creates an area that you can lower your rig into to fish. And when it's like this, You've got to be patient and you've got to lower your rigging amongst the leaves with the caster. You can see how that's working now. It's really worked well. Can you see the area that it's created? But I did that last year on a Winter League match, again, on the Wigan Winter League. And uh, it paid dividends because after two biteless hours, I went across to my caster peg, which had been clear at the start of the match, which was now absolutely ran with leaves. Did this, created some gaps lowered the rigging and went on to narrowly miss out on winning the section. I had uh, just short of four pounds of castor roach, uh, but it got me out of jail. And it's a good tip that when you're on a peg full of leaves. Another top tip for canal anglers is if you go anywhere with Ian Chapman, or Chappy as we call him, and you take an eight pack of Fox chocolatey milk chocolate rounds, don't leave them where we can see them. As you can see here, there are eight in the packet. Oh, I say, six have disappeared. I've only had two. That greedy bug has had the other four. There's another top tip. And it's not just roach that like casters. Look at this, a belting little skimmer. We're going to have a word about rigs for caster fishing on the canal. And there are two types of float which lend themselves to this sort of presentation. The first one's a conventional pole float with a bristle. Here I've got a Drennan, Alan Scotthorn, Silverfish 2 pole float, which has a high vis see-through bristle and a titanium wire stem and a balsa body. This is a 0.2 of a gram, which is ideal for fishing in two feet of water. Now I'm fishing in slightly deeper water with it today, but above the float, if you look there in my hand, there are two number 10 back shot together. They're helping to stabilize the rig. They're, they're counter buffering the wind, if you will, the breeze that's getting up now and then on the canal. And basically, for pole fishing novices, I think it's important to stress that you need to put uh, at least three pieces of pole float sleeving on the stem. You want one just down from the body of the float. If you can see there in my hand, it's about five millimeters down from the body of the float. Another fine piece of tubing uh, is positioned halfway down the stem. And the final piece, and this is critical, is slightly longer and if you see, it actually overlaps the end of the uh, stem. So it, it, it hangs over the end by three or four mil. And I've just got a tuning shot right underneath there, which is basically tight against the floor. And that's the depth I'm fishing. Um, coming down the rig, the main line is 0 0.10. You don't need to go any thicker than that. And again, I'd urge beginners to pole fishing don't think that you need very, very strong line. Remember that the elastic's a fantastic shock absorber. So 0 0.10 line, which breaks at around about two and a quarter pounds is adequate. And then I've got a group of spread 
a spread bulk, if you will, of styles. And they're number nine styles. They've, they've bunched together a little bit because of catching fish and pulling them through all these leaves. If we can just spread them out a touch more, you can see basically that there's about, I don't know, 10 or 11 number nine styles there, just spread about, spread over a distance of about three and a half inches. Those shot are probably 15 inches from the actual bottom of the canal. Coming down the rig again, we've got a half number 14 style, another half number 14 style, and one more, and they're equidistant. They're all roughly about the same distance apart. The bottom one, critically, we just take the hook off, is about nine inches from the hook. And by my reckoning, I'm laying on with this rig by about four inches. So that style is about five inches off the bottom. When I plumbed up this morning, I put the hook, obviously after I plumbed to dead depth, put the hook in the end of the pole. I know from the other two rigs that I've got here that the depth here is about just above this tape mark I've got on the pole to tell me what elastic it is. So as you can see, I'm just a float length deeper than the actual true depth of the peg. And from there to there, we're looking at about three foot four inches. So I'm about three foot eight inches. So that's three, just over three and a half foot deep with the rig. And the true depth of the water is about three foot two, three foot three inches. So four or five inches over depth. And the point of being over depth is to lay this much line on the bottom but have all the shot working for you like an elongated keel, if you will, on a yacht. So from the stem of the float down, you've got a spread bulk, which gives good stability at sort of two thirds depth. And then you've got the finesse for a slow fall through that last 15, 18 inches of water of these three tiny half 14 styles. So the rig goes in, the bulk settles, the cast is still dropping and it's dropping slowly because of these little styles. The roach are watching it, it goes to the bottom, it sits on the bottom, you have enough weight in the float and the stem and the shotting pattern for the float to sit still in the skim and not move, therefore the caster on the hook doesn't move and it looks as natural as the loose fed casters that are just sitting there on the bottom. So that's rig number one. The other thing I'd say about these floats, which is great, just quickly, again, for people who haven't heard of them before, they've been out for a while now, but you can get interchangeable tips and you can get a variety of colors of tips. That'll just pull out, can you see? And you can push another color back in if you so wish. So you've got black, yellow, orange, and red. And I know for people who suffer from color blindness, these are a fantastic boon. It says you're having to buy multiples of floats and paint bristles different colours to suit you. So that's that's the rig, and that's that's the rig I've caught most of the fish on today. The other type of pattern that I use commonly for caster fishing on canals is called a dibber. Now these dibbers that I'm showing you are slightly different to a conventional dibber. Just let me go in my drawer and show you a conventional dibber if I can. On a, on a large scale, that's, that's what a, a dibber usually looks like. These are big dibbers I use for fishing with lobworm on the canal. But a dibber is that shape, it's just a balsa, body up shape with a side eye and either a wire or a carbon stem. But these that I'm using today are actually custom made for me by another cadence angler called Neil Rudd, who really specializes in commercials. And basically what I wanted was a body up shape like this, so there's more buoyancy and more of a fulcrum near the top of the float. And I wanted that for dealing with water that tows because essentially they're like a mini stick float. You can control these, you can hang on to them. They've got a high vis short, nice thick bristle in them that you can see. And you can, you can dot them down and then just grease them up with some uh, bristle grease or Vaseline so they sit in the surface film and these again have got a nice carbon wire stem which you can't bend out of shape 
you'll notice if you look at them, one's a 0.2 gram, the other's a 0.3. The 0.2 gram dibber is a finesse rig. Again, it's set about five inches over depth. So if I just actually put that back in the pole end for a second, on here you'll see that's my mark today for dead depth just above this tape. That's an old mark there, I can get rid of that. That's just liquid paper. And you can see the float is set, a float length exactly deeper than true dead depth. And again, it's 0.10 main line. And in this instance, it's a series of styles again. And again, they've moved about in the leaves today, just move them apart slightly. So you can see you start off with say a number 10 and another number 10 down to nines and then sevens. And on this rig, you've got a seven here below the main spread bulk. And then you've got one half 14 style there. And that really sits on the loop to loop for the hook length. We haven't talked about the hook lengths really yet, but the main line's 0.10. My hook lengths today have been 0.08. That again is a good breaking strain. It breaks at about one pound 10. The hook is a Colmic N957, which is a, an, a nickel hook, wide gape, and uh, you know very good for caster fishing so that that's a 0.2 of a gram rig and again that's designed for a slower drop so if the roach are a little bit suspicious or a bit iffy they can watch that caster drop through on that rig and decide whether they want to have a go it will help to trick the odd wary fish put that one back there but the main rig i've used today because of all the leaves in front of us to get the bait through the leaves and to get the caster down to the bottom effectively is the same type of float, but in a 0.3 of a gram size. And the difference with this is that it's got a 0.2 of a gram lock and slide olivette. But if you look at that olivette in comparison to the hook, it's getting on for two feet away from the hook. And it's a very simple rig. All I've got underneath that olivette are three strung out number seven styles. Can you see there one? two, finally three. And I've got about 10 inches of line from the last style to the hook. So again, five inches over depth. And that's that last style, that last drop is five inches off the bottom. And what I'm trying to achieve with that Olivet is proper stability when the wind skim gets up really badly. But it's also, it's also to make sure that that's acting like a a keel. Imagine the stem of the floor extending down for just over two feet and that's what you're achieving by using a, a bulk in the form of an olivet. You're giving that float proper stability because again as we said at the outset caster is a static bay it's an inert bay. You don't want a light rig that the wind picks up and drags all over your peg because that means your hook bait's being bumped along the bottom unnaturally and the roach will look at it and say not having that, that's not natural. The ones that are just sitting there on the bottom waiting to be eaten, sucked in, are the ones you want. And if your hook is mimicking the loose feed, you have a chance of a bite. When you're fishing on a canal, it's very important that your elastic works properly and is smooth flowing. It's so important to carry a little bottle of pole lube. I mean, this is an old cosmetic bottle that I've doctored but it fits in my box nice and neatly. It means I'm not carrying a big bulky bottle about, but every hour or so, just take a few seconds out to squirt a few squirts of pole lube down the pole onto your elastic and just be patient and just pull the elastic out a few times like this. And eventually you'll see the lube squirting out at the end of the pole tip. There you go. And this will minimise the chances of you bumping any fish. Another great tip is to make sure you carry plenty of spur hook lengths tied up. The moment of truth is when you try to bury the hook into a caster and the caster splats, you know you've got a blunt hook on your hands. And it's the simplest thing to take 10 seconds out to change it. So you'll see how I always carry a good number tied up, pre-tied. 
and in a match when every ounce counts and every dram counts on a hard winter league less time spent changing hooks means more time spent fishing which equates to more chance of catching fish and beating your rivals either side of you. In the parlance of the Lancastrian, that is a canal crumper. Well, as you can see, I'm using the Caden CP2000 pole. I've had this now for 18 months. Fabulous piece of kit. Stiff, slim, responsive and uh, I'm using a number five Preston slip elastic just through the number two section of the pole and about 10 inches of the micro tip cut back. And uh, we're hopefully gonna sign off with another lovely caster fish. The light's starting to fade and the sun's dropping and a lovely way to sign off. Yeah, it's a cracking fish, you can see it now. Beautiful. The most timid bite as well, that probably took about 30 seconds to develop. There he is. I think he's ours now. Got you. A lovely way to round off a super day. Look at that. Well, I'm well pleased with this cracking cast of coat catch of canal fish. Absolutely fantastic. Thanks for watching.